Well, good morning. Hey, it's great to see you here this sunshiny day, a little different than last weekend. We're glad that you're here. And for those who caught us online last week, we're certainly glad to have been in worship with you in one way or the other. Well, I have some questions for you today to kick it off. There are no grades that will be taken, but um, we're going to see how sharp you are. I want to see if I name a date on the calendar, if you can tell me the occasion, holiday, whatever, that coincides with that date, okay? So July 4th would be Independence Day. Bright group, you are rolling hot and fast today. Okay, how about this date changes, but on April 12th, it falls this year. What do you think it is this year? Easter <laughs> at the Matthewson even to bonus, but it's also their anniversary. So, hey, that's what is the really important part of that day. Okay, how about tomorrow? Martin Luther King Day, and then how about October 20th? Some birthdays, okay. October 20th, don't know what that day is? No, it's actually Information Overload Day. <laughs> it was established in 2007 by the Information Overload Research Group. And they designated this day to remind us that we have too much information. So what did they do? They created another day that we have to remember. I don't quite get that. So anyway, it, it's all overwhelming. And we're going to talk about being overwhelmed. And I actually got this, um, this cat picture in a text this week. And I was like, that's how I feel <laughs> sometimes. Like it's too much to cover and carry all the time. I was like, we're going to see that picture again this weekend. So anyway, we're going to pray this morning. But we're going to talk about what it feels like to be overwhelmed in life. And how can we change our hearts and thoughts about feeling overwhelmed. So would you pray with me? Lord God, we come to you in this time seeking your direction and your wisdom, your peace. Lord, you are Lord of our lives. Would you speak to our hearts this morning, opening our eyes and ears and giving us a receptive spirit, Lord, to hear from you. And Lord, would you speak through me. In your strong name we pray. Amen. Well, in the new year, we are inundated with things about losing weight, reading more books than we did last year, drinking more water, exercising more, all of these things that create a great start to the new year. And we've been talking about the art of the start, and so we're going to talk this morning about being overwhelmed with some of those starts. Now, um, I don't know about you, but these first three weeks of the 2020 year have seemed like a very long three weeks. And um, it can be overwhelming. I get overwhelmed too. And so in order to help me not feel overwhelmed and feel like I'm on top of things, I set timers. Now my daughter Morgan can attest to this. She was poking fun at her mother one day about all the timers on her phone. And she went through and counted them because I forget to erase them once I use them. No joke, I had almost 300 timers I had set. I've even set a timer to remind myself to set a timer. Like, it's ridiculous. So, but we can feel overwhelmed with it all. And on top of all we want to do, there are things that we just have to do. But then sometime in the midst of it, we get thrown a curveball. We have an accident or we have um, an illness. Sometimes we even have a death. And it changes things, and we feel overwhelmed. And we have this trouble thinking about all we need to do because we can't think straight, and we let those little daily tasks build up till all of a sudden what used to be taking us just minutes becomes this insurmountable task, and we don't want to do it, and we become overwhelmed. We have bills and tuitions and job loss and cutting hours, and we have a relocation, and we are overwhelmed. And we have these seasons in life that we maybe don't even have anything going wrong. It's just so much to do. And my dad's mom, my Nana, always had this quotation that she quoted. It was from a poet, and her name was Edna St. Vincent Millay. And she would often write this in letters to people to remind them to do just the opposite of what these words say. It says, my candle burns at both ends. It will not last the night. But all my foes and oh my friends, it gives a lovely light. Burning that candle at both ends and going and going and going, overwhelmed 
And in the midst of all of it, sometimes we have really beautiful things that happen. We have graduations and birthdays and weddings and babies and puppies. So I thought I should introduce you to our new puppy. I decided, don't know what I was thinking, to buy the children a puppy for Christmas. I hope I can recognize him if he runs away. But his, <laughs> this, this is Walker, and he's a mini Aussie. And Walker, our, Walker and I are in this love, not sure if I love you yet, relationship. He's 10 weeks old. I'm trying to house train him, and he's got a lot of energy. So I was really fed up with him yesterday, and I was just like, Walker, I'm going to get rid of you. You don't need to live here anymore. We need to find a new home for you. And my children heard all of this. So as I'm preparing for the sermon, I decided to share something about Walker, and I sent this text to my children. Does anyone have a really good picture of Walker that you could text me? And this is what Coleman comes back with. You are not selling the dog. <laughs> Chapman says, Mom, in a couple of months, Walker will be potty trained, and you won't have to worry about it. So then Coleman sends me the picture, and this is what he says. If you put this on Facebook and try to sell the dog, I will buy him back. <laughs> Overwhelmed. So we try to navigate these seasons of life, and sometimes we do it better than we should. You know, we do time other times. Sometimes we yell and scream and cry, and we feel like we want to run away. But today we're going to talk about a man who also was overwhelmed, and his name was Paul. Now, Paul is a, um, had 13 books of the Bible that we can directly attribute to his penmanship, and he wrote letters to encourage people and direct people in their walks with Christ. Now, Paul had this, what he called, a thorn in his flesh. Now, scholars have studied this based on um, clues within Scripture and other historical texts, and we're not really sure what this was. Maybe it was an eye disease, it could have been migraines, it may be malaria, or, um, epilepsy, we're not really sure. And today, we're not really focused on what it was that ailed him as much as how he handled this. So we're going to look at 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, and see how Paul refers to this. So Paul says, concerning this, this thorn in his flesh, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is, power is perfected in weakness. And most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, and the power of Christ may dwell in me. And therefore, I am well content with my weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, it sounds like that Paul had his share of being overwhelmed with life. In fact, Paul had been shipwrecked. He'd been flogged. He had been lied about. He had been falsely imprisoned. He went without food and water. And this whole time, he's dealing with this thorn in his flesh, overwhelmed. And yet, Paul says in verse 10, I am well content. But how is that possible See, before Paul became a Christian, before he came to know about Jesus, he had been um, studying the law, the Old Testament, what we would know that as, and all about God. He had learned the aspects of who God is. And before he became a Christian and a follower of Christ, he would beat, persecute, imprison, and kill both men and women as they talked and proclaimed who Jesus was because Paul did not yet recognize that Jesus was the Son of God. And so this Paul, he would have been taught by the best teachers and was taught by the best teachers in Israel as he was growing up. And he would have been taught on the steps of the temple called the teaching steps. Now, when I was in Israel, we got to spend some time on these teaching steps and we got to read scriptures there. It was one of my very favorite times of our time there. Now, you'll see this picture of the steps and as you'll we'll just zoom a little bit, and you'll see the difference of the steps in the depth of the steps as you take a step. Now, there's a couple of different thoughts about why these steps were built this way. Perhaps it was so when the people were going into the temple, they slowed their pace down, being intentional about how they walked into the temple and preparing their hearts for worship. 
And then another thought is, as they were walking up these steps, they had the Psalms of Ascent. These many psalms that were set to this rhythm of the way the steps were paced out. Now, I don't know Hebrew, but this is something that it might have looked like. So on Psalm 122, 2, it says, Oh, our feet are standing in your gates, O Israel. So as they were taking those steps, it might like, Oh, our feet are standing in your gates, O Israel. You know, just to be this meter, and they would say these psalms as they would go into the temple. And so this last photo, Krista Kempton and I were on this trip together, and she sent this to me, and she's at the top, and it's looking down on our group sitting on those steps, and you can see Jerusalem on the horizon. So Paul was this brightest of the brightest, and he was memorizing scripture all through his life, and he had this head knowledge of who God is after studying it, but it wasn't until he had an encounter with Jesus, the risen Lord, that his heart truly began to understand all aspects of who God is. And it's likely that Paul would have memorized Psalm 136. Now, a few weeks ago, uh, Jim shared with us about the Hillel verses, these psalms of thanksgiving. And um, some scholars say that Psalm 136 is the great Hillel. And interestingly, I think he had just preached that sermon like the week before we left. And when we got on our tour bus, our tour guide got on and he said, hi, my name is Hillel. And in Hebrew, and I'm looking at Chris, I'm like, it means hallelujah. I know that already. And he's like, and it means hallelujah. I'm like, yes, we knew that. It was so fun to have that information prior to. So in this Psalm 136, we're going to look at it in just a minute. But it starts with that God... They said, God, we give God thanks, for God is good. We give God thanks, for God is the God of gods, for God is the Lord of lords. And it goes on to recognize God's hand in helping the Israelites, how God parted the Red Sea, how God created the earth, how God created the sun, and finally thanking God for all of God's care for us. And we can't really get the flow of this psalm quite right because we don't have the cadence of the Hebrew words. And we do our very best in translating to get the words that in Hebrew would mean the same thing in English, but it doesn't always work out quite right. For example, if someone came here to visit us at this church, our community theme is say yes. But if they go back using their own language to, dis- to tell that they had been to the Say Yes Church and they didn't have exact words, they might say, I went to Say an Affirmative Response Church. It doesn't have quite the same ring or the same rhythm to it. So that's what happens when, we tra- when they translate these texts. And interestingly, instead of give thanks, one commentator said that the word should be confess that we confess Yahweh because Yahweh is good. We confess that God is the God of gods. We confess that God is the Lord of lords. And it's not simply saying thanks, but giving God credit for who God is, that God is God and we are not. Now, I know that should seem obvious, but in my own spirit, I sometimes forget that I don't know better than God. So as we read this portion of this psalm today, I want you to remember that this would have been sung. Probably a soloist would have been singing the first line that I'm going to read in white, and I want you all to read it in blue. Now, there's going to be a lot of times you have to read this one line of God's love endures forever. But keep up the steam, and let's make it all the way through this psalm. So if you'll read the line in blue, I'll read the line in white. Give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. To God who alone does great wonders. By who God's understanding made the heavens who spread out the earth upon the waters, who made the great lights, 
the sun to govern the day, the moon and the stars to govern the night, to God who struck down the firstborn of Egypt and brought Israel out from among them with a mighty hand and outstretched arm to God who divided the Red Sea asunder and brought Israel out through the midst of it, but swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. To God who led God's people through the wilderness. God remembered us in our low estate and freed us from our enemies. God gives food to every creature. Give thanks to the God of heaven. Now, friends, what do we know about love? God's love endures forever, right? But for the people that you love, wouldn't you move heaven and earth if you could for them? And think about this, that God's love is so much more than we can begin to love. God's love endures forever. And we only read like 21 of the 26 verses, but the Jews would have committed this psalm to memory. They would have recited it over and over and over again, and they would have engraved these words upon their heart. God's love endures forever. And I believe that this is where Paul found content with with this times of being overwhelmed because when he was in trials, I think he chose to focus on being overwhelmed by God's love instead of on the circumstances. God's love and care had been engraved upon his heart and mind. And if you ever read a self-help book, they'll tell you to write down your plans to write them down so your goals, so you know what to focus on. And it's so that you keep those things in front of you and you remind yourself when times get hard that you want to know what your goals are in life. And the psalmist knew this as well because this psalm would have written, been written in a time of oral tradition. Long before it was written down, they would have spoken this to each other and to their children, reminding each other that God's love endures forever. So what if we take the moments that we have stress and difficulty and focus on knowing more about God? I found in some of my most stressful times that if I will stop and step back and focus on who God is instead of the circumstances, I become overwhelmed with God's love. And what if we were be able to become overwhelmed with God's goodness and care? What if we were able to become overwhelmed by the love that God shows us? Perhaps this is where Paul able, was able to find the contentment that he writes about. And if we were to become overwhelmed by God's love, how would we make different decisions? How would our sleep patterns change? In Mark 7:37 we read of Jesus healing a man who could not speak and he could not hear and I want you to see what the people said about Jesus. They said the people were overwhelmed with amazement with God's love and care and the assurance that God's love endures forever. Now, I've asked Mo Noah and Morgan to share a song with you today. This is not our song of response. But it's a song that I pray touches your heart this morning. <laughs> 
Psalm 136, we read about God creating the heavens and the earth, but I can't relate to that. We read that God created a sun, but I can't relate to that. We read that God separated the Red Sea for the Israelites to pass through, and I can't relate to that. But when I hear that God is working in the hearts of God's people and changing lives, I can relate to that. When I hear that God is healing and restoring and bringing families back together, I can relate to that. Where was it for you? Where did you hear God's cry on your heart? When did you respond to follow God? Because God is doing this every single day. God's not making a new son, but he is changing a life. He's not making a new world, but he is working within the hearts of us. And that's what God does, overwhelming us with his enduring love. And that's what God does best. That is what God does best. pray with me. Lord God, we are overwhelmed with life so often, but Lord, would you overwhelm us with your love? Would you work in our hearts, Lord, that we would be receptive to knowing your love, that we would be watchful of your hand moving on our life? Lord, astound us, amaze us. Lord, we love you and you are so beautiful we're so thankful for how you care for us in your strong name we pray now i want to share one more thing with you when we talked about the steps of the temple another aspect of it was that on one side they went up and on the other side of the steps they went down directing traffic but sometimes when someone had a difficulty in their life, when they felt overwhelmed with life and they couldn't speak that, they would go up the down steps or they would come down the up steps. And this was a way that they could share with their friends, I'm hurting, I'm overwhelmed with life and I can't do it. And that friend would see them and they would come to them and say, hey, what's going on? Why are you walking the wrong way? And they could share their griefs and their hurts without saying a word. So now this morning, there are people here to pray with you. And you don't have to be overwhelmed for someone to come and pray with you. You can come with a prayer request or share a praise. But if you are simply overwhelmed with life, come now and we'll pray with you and remind you that God wants to overwhelm you with God's enduring love.